think you have the storm, so I, I think uh, I'm going to preach peace to those who are near and those who are far, right? But uh, what a joy and honor to be here, and thank you, uh, Wayne and Anne, always for the shepherding heart that you guys have and your commitment to the Word of God and, and teaching whoever is here who's, who has been drawn here by the Holy Spirit to, to live here, uh, either for a season of, or for a lifetime, as well as those who come uh, to, to see what God is doing here and see what the enemy is doing as well. So um, it's an honor to, to be able to share and uh, bring the Word of God to you today. It's been a hard week. I mean, that's, you know, what else can you say? I, I arrived 10 days ago with these pastors and uh, had a couple days to sort of settle in and make final preparations for uh, these two conferences. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to say, I, I, was, rec- I was recalling um, the Apostle Paul w- uh, when he was saying, uh, I think it was Acts 20, you know, I am bound by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen there. And... Um, <laughs> I think he goes on to say things like, <laughs> I sense that there's going to be trouble, you know. The Holy Spirit has warned him of that, but he was supposed to go anyway. And I want to say, I want to commend you all for those of you who are not here normally. Uh, this is not usually what you do. You're here on, a, uh, on business, or you're here uh, to visit a friend, or you're here on a tour. Uh, some of you, you've been here before sometimes. Some of you have never been here before. In fact, how many people have never been to Israel prior to this particular trip? Well, I commend you for coming not knowing what was going to happen. I think it would be, I think it's a very sweet thing when people who love Jesus are willing to do what Jesus says, even when it's hard. And I think that in this time, this period that we're in, and as we go forward deeper into the last days, deeper into the fulfillment of prophecies where there will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. A nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom. In a general way, that's true, and then specifically, very specific wars against the nation of Israel will happen. Uh, Some of them are quite horrific. They're all horrific, but some are even more horrific than others. And yet, followers of Jesus Christ are not supposed to be abandoning the people of this land. Uh, They are supposed to be embracing, encouraging, praying for, supporting, standing with the people here because that's what the Lord is doing. And this, we are on the road not to Armageddon. Yes, we are. We are on the road to Romans 11.26, the day when all Israel will be saved. And... That's not going to happen if followers who do already know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus won't stand with, pray for, encourage, invest in the people that live here. And so uh, how special it is when people who love Jesus are going up the one-way street in the wrong direction when everyone's leaving to say, we love you. And if there's a way we can help, if there's a way we can encourage, we will do it. But we just want you to know we're here And we will not abandon you. We will not cut you loose. Some who stood in the name of Jesus did that in days gone by, but that's not going to be us. And I thank you for that heart that you had. And I encourage you, as you go home, uh, to encourage others to prayerfully consider coming here as well. Uh, Because this is not a season from this point forward uh, to abandon Israel or Israel's neighbors. And so that's an important element. Now, I did not come here thinking that we would be here in the midst of um, Operation Pillar of Defense. Uh, and as you, you know, as you know, you've been seeing it and experiencing it. There's been uh, about 800 rockets and missiles fired at Israel from Gaza uh, just since Wednesday. There had been 160 rockets and missiles fired from Gaza at Israel just the weekend before that. And that's why Israel took action on Wednesday morning, and then uh, the gates of hell were opened. And of course, that's what the, uh, the leaders of Hamas said, that they, that they would open the gates of hell. But I, we all know, but let's remind each other, that Jesus said, here in this land, I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we pray for the day when not only every person in Israel, Jewish, Arab, Druze, Bedouin, visitor from every walk of life, every continent, will hear and know and be able to respond one way or the other to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that everyone in Gaza and everyone in the West Bank will hear and be able to make a decision one way or the other for Jesus or not. This is the mission of the church, that in the midst of bad news, we have good news, good news that we have personally experienced, that we have been personally transformed by and therefore, that's all the more reason, again, to want to come and be here if the Lord is in it. I mean, if the Lord doesn't tell you to come, stay away from this land. You know, none of us have any business being here unless the Lord invites us. He's very jealous for what he's doing here, and he doesn't intend for us to uh, get in his way. But if we will be bond servants of his and do what he tells us to do, we have good news amidst all this bad news. And my... My heart is that we be strengthened in how amazing that good news really is, how good it really is, and, and therefore not, never to be uh, swayed from it, never to let it be diluted, never to let that good news part from our lips, and by that I mean not speak it, not, com <laughs> not to communicate it. We need to be faithful in preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ until he comes. Amen. Because he's coming here. Amen. He's going to be right down the street. <laughs> and, and this seems like, you know, and, and there are many Christians who are, who are struggling with, I want to bless Israel, but don't worry, I won't tell anyone about Jesus. And this, is, this comes from a, a, a misunderstanding of what it means to bless. It comes from a sense of, look, I know a lot of things have been done Badly or meanly or cruelly to the Jewish people, for example, by people who call themselves Christians. And the problem was, people have, some people have decided to reconcile that or, or adjust by saying, we will love you, we will care for you, but don't worry, we won't offend you by talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that all of us need him, including Jewish people. Now, I want to just say, as a Jewish person, Jewish on my father's side, Gentile on my mother's side, I am grateful for each and every Gentile that said, Joel, you need Jesus. You don't have some special deal. It's not, you don't have some special arrangement by which you don't need to receive your own Messiah. I'm grateful for the lady that ran the, uh, the little vacation Bible school around the corner. I did not want to go. Mind you, uh, my parents had gotten saved in 1973, my mother first, then six months later my father, and they then began dragging my sister off the church. Not a fan. I was not a fan of going to church. Uh, I was glad to see that they, their lives were changing. That was wonderful for them. But I was, you know, I was stuffed in a little Sunday school class with the pastor's son and the elder's daughters, and they all knew the Bible already. They all knew all the stories. I didn't know anything. Literally nothing. They, I don't know if you've ever forced your kids to, I mean, uh, encourage your kids to have sword drills. <laughs> you know, have you ever heard of a sword drill where you, you say, ready, John 3.16. Every, every kid holds their Bible up, and then ready, and, and then whoever finds it first gets a baseball bat and a ball, <laughs> well, at least in our church. And I, I loved baseball, and I, I wanted that bat. I wanted that ball. But when they said, ready, John 3.16, I thought, John? Who's John? <laughs> I see a Mark, I see a Jenny, I see a Carrie, I see a Nancy. I, I don't see a John. And uh, I never won. Not once, not even close. One time, one time. Uh, well, well, eventually I was so embarrassed because I didn't know the Bible, didn't have a Bible. So my parents decided to buy me a little New Testament uh, with Psalms and Proverbs in the back. Have you seen these? They're like, like a Gideon-type Bible. Very little. Uh, but this New, New Testament with the Psalms and the Proverbs. So one day, oh, here we go, another chance to win a baseball bat, uh, and it was a sword drill. So ready, what's the last book of the Bible? Oh, oh, I got my hand up. It was like Jeopardy. I, I, everyone, no one could believe it. I don't recall ever having raised my hand. I had never been first, 
And everyone was stunned. And I think they thought, well, this will either be hilarious or there's progress. There's hope for Joel. And uh, so they said, oh, the teacher was so surprised. He said, uh, yes, Joel, wh what's the last book of the Bible? I said, Proverbs. <laughs> well, you did what they did. They started to laugh. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, no, actually, it's Revelation. I said, not my Bible. <laughs> right there, fork it over, black and white. Come on. You, you know you want to give it to me. Come on. And they didn't. They wouldn't. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. What do I have to do to prove it to you people? It's Proverbs. And I'm still a little bitter. I, I, I concede that. <laughs> still working out that sanctification. That, but no, the only thing worse than Sunday school, for me personally, was the fact that, you know, in our church, we didn't have Sunday school in the summer. I'm not quite sure why, looking back, because you figure the kids have more time, you could really invest in them more deeply. Oh, well, no, we said summer vacation. And I was like, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And then my parents said, oh, no, you're going to go to vacation Bible school. What? Every day? I mean, this was, you know, it's one thing to go once a week to prison. But then, I mean, you know, Sunday school. But then every day? And you know what they do in vacation Bible school, right? They do crafts. I hate crafts. And they sing. I, I, I wasn't a big fan of singing. I'm not good now. I didn't want to be there. I, and, and, you know, I, I can think of a lot of better ways to spend my summer morning than writing Jesus Loves Me with elbow macaroni on burlap, okay? <laughs> not a fan. <laughs> However, I once was preaching in Maryland, and I was telling this story part of a larger, you know, my testimony, and I was telling this story, and I, I was really hamming it up a bit, you know, even as a Jew, I was hamming it up, and I, and I, I people were laughing, I know, and uh, stay with me, and I was, people were laughing, and I, and I was, but anyway, but it was true, but what I didn't, I made a mistake that night, because I didn't finish that story by saying, but you know, I am grateful for that woman who held that little vacation Bible school in her in her, in her home, in her basement, because she taught me about Jesus. I heard the gospel clearly, and I received Jesus as my Savior as a result. I forgot to mention that. And that was a particularly bad night to forget that, because who was in the lobby to meet me afterwards? The lady whose house it was, who, the lady who led that Bible, that little vacation Bible school. I had not been thankful <laughs> that week. I say it everywhere, but I just didn't say it that. And, I, and she goes, wow, that was really sad. I hadn't seen her in 30 years. And I was shocked to see her, and, and, uh, but grateful. And I said, I, I really apologize. I am grateful for what you did. As a Gentile, you didn't say, oh, that little Joel, he's Jewish. He has a special ticket to heaven. I don't even need to tell him about Jesus. I'll just let him go out and play in the backyard. She didn't do that. Nor did she say, well, well, Joel, he's got a hard heart. He's a stiff neck. He's, he's blind as a bat. There's no point in telling him the gospel. Uh, nor did, you know, she didn't say that. Nor did she say, I love Jews so much that I'm not going to offend Joel and his family. I, I just won't tell him about Jesus, but we can, I'll just give him an extra cookie. And, and she didn't do that. She treated me just like everybody else, like little sinners that we were in need of a savior, in need of our Messiah. She made it simple. She wasn't a theologian. She wasn't clever. She just told me that Jesus loved me. And she began to read to me and the other, the Bible. And I'm grateful. And I hope that's what your life is about here and as you go back around the world, wherever you go, whatever part, walk of life that is, I hope that you are telling everyone that you, can, that you see, everyone that you know, everyone that you do not know, that Jesus is the Messiah, and all of us need him. Now, if you turn to Titus chapter 1, I, I, I will, I'll mention a few more things about where we are in terms of this war and everything, but, but I just want to put it in context. This, this, the war is not the big story. I mean, it is. It's huge. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, Iran has given, provided missiles to Hamas that has been now fired at Jerusalem. The first time that missiles have been fired at Jerusalem since 1970. Even Saddam Hussein did not fire 
any of the 39 Scud missiles back in 1991 at Jerusalem, the holy city. But Hamas has. And as you know, Tel Aviv has been hit, and, and, and neither city has suffered as much as all of the cities and towns and villages in the south. And of course, the Palestinians are suffering too. Those who've been caught under the tyranny of Hamas, 60 of, their, of the Hamas rockets have landed in Gaza on the Palestinians. This is a nightmare in every possible way. We, we can and must pray. I know that you're praying. We can and must encourage people, and we must uh, provide humanitarian relief as we can. And I'm sure that you're, I hope that you're engaged in that. If you're not, uh, this is a good congregation to have attended tonight because they're doing all of this, and you can be involved in what King of Kings is doing. But at the core, the church uh, needs to be doing all those things. But the church needs to remember that our main role in, in times of bad news is to be people who live and proclaim the good news. We can't f affect government policy usually. And so we, you and I have little or no influence, aside from prayer, which is very powerful, over what Mr. Netanyahu does or uh, Chairman Abbas or the leaders of Hamas or any of the leaders around the world. But we can do what the Bible tells us to do, and that's why even when rockets were flying even before this all started, our team still felt the Lord was calling us to come and to go through this pastor's conference and to go through the book that we had already felt the Holy Spirit telling us to go through, which was the book of Titus. And what I'd like to do tonight is just read the book of Titus. It's only 46 verses. Let's do that, and then let's draw out uh, some um, important elements for us. We're not going to be able to do a verse-by-verse -verse, uh, study of Titus tonight, but I would encourage you to do some study of your own this week in this little book. Uh, 46 verses, and Paul, with the Holy Spirit via Paul, packed an awful lot into here. Let's read the Word of God and listen to the Word of God and see what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Titus chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is in accordance with godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. That's his opening. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long sentence. We'll get back to that. So that's from Paul, the bondservant, the apostle, the proclaimer of Jesus Christ and his word. To Titus, my true child in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason, Titus, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, the faithful word of God, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men who are empty talkers and deceivers, especially of those of the circumcision, who must be silenced, 
because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for every good deed. But as for you, Titus, speak these things which are fitting, I'm sorry, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage or train the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, I urge the young men, be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity in doctrine and dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient and to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also were once foolish. We were foolish ourselves. We were disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in, in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, Titus, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to be engaged in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so that they will not be unfruitful. And all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul was a man who had been transformed by Christ, right? This is a man who hated Jesus. This was a Pharisee, more Jewish than any of us. A Pharisee absolutely at the top of the, of the heap, as it were. He was at the top of his game. As a Jewish legal Pharisee, he was as good as you could possibly get in his religion. There was only one problem. He was wrong. He didn't see the totality of scriptures saying to him, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem Ephrata. He, the Messiah is going to teach in parables. The Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. The Messiah is going to have disciples. The Messiah is going to be surrounded by evil men at some point. After he's healed the sick and uh, taken care of the, uh, the, the needy and, and made the blind to see, all these miracles that the Messiah will do according to the prophets. And then he'll be surrounded by evil men and he will be killed because God wanted him to be killed, crushed for our iniquities. But he'll be doing this to make himself a guilt offering, the prophets told us. And then he will rise from the dead. He will not, his body will not decay after he's been put in the tomb of a rich man. He will come back to life and bear much fruit. Paul, a genius, a, an absolute brilliant man, trained in the best schools, uh, access to the best understanding of the, of the Bible, uh, speaking multiple languages, he was blind as a bat. He couldn't see it. All that learning had, had not helped him discover that the Messiah had just, been a, had just been here. And that all these people who were saying, yes, wow, oh my goodness, Yeshua really is the Messiah. He's the Messiah that we've waited for all of our lives. And he's here changing our lives. <clears throat> Paul couldn't see it. And honestly, if somebody had sat down with him and shared the four spiritual laws with him, it wouldn't have worked. Stephen did it. Stephen preached the gospel to him, among others, and they killed him for it. But one day... Paul was on a mission, Saul, his, of course his name was Saul at that time, and he went to Damascus, and you know the story. The Lord opened his eyes in this dramatic series of events that helped him realize that he was completely wrong. All, he was zealous, but for the wrong things. And the Lord transformed him. I mean, absolutely game-changing transformation. And... And Saul, who became Paul, became one of the great apostles of the, of the early church and wrote nearly half the New Testament. But Paul, whose passion was to preach the gospel, 
Paul, whose passion was to share the gospel with ordinary, you know, everyday citizens as well as with kings. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who wanted to preach the gospel all through Asia, all through Europe, and wanted to take the gospel not only to Rome, the capital of the world at the time, but Paul wanted to take the gospel to Spain. Now, why did Paul want to go to Spain to preach the gospel? Well, because Jesus had said that the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Well, Paul, in his understanding at the time, like everyone else, probably thought the world was flat and had an end. He didn't think of it as, you know, all points on the earth. He thought of it as the end. And everyone thought that Spain was at the edge of the earth. And the Strait of Gibraltar, there's actually a pillar there. I've been there. And it says, as you, as you sail through those, you know, those, uh, which I think was called the, the Pillars of Hercules, the, the mountains coming down from Morocco and the mountains coming down from Spain, as you sail through there, good luck, you're going over the edge. <laughs> Not emotionally. They thought it was physical. That's it. That's the ends of the earth. That's one of them. And Paul had already blocked, been blocked from going deeper into Asia. right? He wanted to bring the gospel deeper into Asia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow him to. So therefore, he thought, if I can't go east, I'm going west, right to the end. And uh, this was his passion, right? This is because he'd been transformed, because he could say in, from chapter 3, verse 3 of Titus, I was foolish, I was disobedient, I was deceived, I was enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. I spent my life in malice and envy, hating people, hating one another. But, but, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared to me, Paul could say, he saved me. Not because I, anything I had done righteous, to the opposite. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of, by the Holy Spirit, whom he, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, poured out upon us richly, upon me richly, through Jesus Christ my Savior. That's, that's Paul's testimony. He's saying right there, I was a horrible, horrible person. I thought I had all these righteous deeds, but they were horrible in God's sight. None of it was useful, although it looked really good on the outside. And Paul is saying to Titus, I've been changed. The Holy Spirit has regenerated me. I was dead in my sins, in my soul. Sure, alive physically, but I was dead on the inside. And the Holy Spirit resurrected me. He washed me. He cleansed me. He, he, he breathed life into me. And now I want to tell everybody about the good news that dead people can live. That people who think they're doing the right thing but aren't can suddenly have their eyes open, can suddenly have their heart resurrected and come to faith in Jesus because of his mercy, because of his grace, not because of themselves. This was, this was Paul's life. He knew it. But you know what's interesting to me about Paul is that while he had a great passion to preach the gospel to anyone who moved, anything that, anyone that was in front of him, he had a very interesting approach to ministry. And that was, don't go preach the gospel unless you have someone around you who can learn how to do it also. Ident prayerfully identify men like Titus, men like Timothy, men like Artemis and Tychicus, men who, are, who have a heart to know the Lord, who's, who God is regenerating them to, and teach them to do what you're doing. Older men are supposed to take younger men under their wing and teach them. Some people get confused in chapter 2 when it, because it seems like the older men have so little to do. Well, the older women, they're supposed to teach younger women, right? The older women, they're supposed to take younger women sort of under their wing and invest in them, disciple them, help them in all the different areas of their life. Certainly spiritually, but also practically. How to love their husbands and love their children and, and be kind and be a witness for Jesus in the culture. 
And, and some people look at chapter 2 and they say, chapter 2, verse 2, well, older men, all they have to do is be temperate. In other words, don't be an idiot. And, uh, you know, be dignified. You know, don't, don't be a dirty old man. Don't be wild. Don't be, just be dignified. You know, show some dignity in the spirit. Be sensible and, and sound in the faith. In other words, that sound, it keeps coming up. Sound doctrine, sound in the faith. Uh, this is healthy. This, this, this is the biblical word. Being, it, means, it means being healthy, being, having a healthy understanding of the whole counsel of God's word. Make sure you're sound, healthy in the faith and in love and in perseverance. Now, that's an important list, but some people look at that list and they say, that's it? The women have to do all this? I mean, they, you know, some women would, would think, well, that's classic. You know, I mean, we've got a list of stuff we're doing. And they... They just have to not look like an idiot. You know, they just have to, you know, have, re you know, sound, reasonable doctrine and then, you know, be loving and then move on with their lives. We have all this stuff. <laughs> but those who, who, who see that are, 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 are misreading the text because older men, by definition, are elders, right? Now, uh, we were doing this, I was doing this study with my young boys. We have four sons and my youngest is eight and I was, saying, I was saying to all of them, what, boys, what is an elder? And fortunately, Noah answered first, because I think the older boys would have given a more spiritual church-type answer. But Noah said, someone who's old. <laughs> right. Well, now, that, of course, that's all relative, right? Because some people think they're old, and other people say, no, that's not old. That's old. And you know, whatever. You've got a whole range of people. Everything's relative. But not, not scripturally, no, don't, but, you know, in terms of age. But my point is, elders are men who have all these other character qualifications of chapter 1, but also have all those characters. They're teaching, they're training, they're, they're, they're contradicting, or they're, they're refuting those who contradict, they're exhorting. That's a great word. It can mean encouragement on the one side, to be positive. It also means to challenge um, someone to do something they're not doing. Uh, that's exhortation. But all those characteristics in chapter 1 that an elder, an older man is supposed to be doing, um, there's a role in the church of being an elder. You know, as the Lord, uh, uh, and, and Paul was telling Titus to appoint men like this to be overseers of the church, to be pastors, to be in the role that we would call an elder, though it may not technically be a pastor. But then all those roles of, of running the church, of investing, doing ministry, all those men who are leading the church need to have all of these characteristics. Well, the old, well, all men, certainly whatever definition you give to older, need to be qualified to be available, to be appointed as an elder, even if they're not. In other words, how can, these, how can Titus find men who are qualified to be appointed as elders if they're not already that way? Right? I mean... You, you have to draw out, you have to, you have to pick from a pool of people who are already maturing like this. So that means all the men in the church should be moving on the trajectory towards all those qualifications in chapter 1. Not a lot of men are. A lot of men are just not showing that type of desire to grow into full maturity so that they would be qualified if the Lord said, I'm calling you into it a role in the church of oversight. That's a problem. That's why a lot of churches around the world, and even here in the land, uh, are, are weaker than they should be because not all men are stepping up. They read chapter 2, verse 2, and they go, well, I, you know, I, can, I can pretty much check that list off. You know, but the older women, you know, you got a lot to do there, sweetheart. You know, you got... Are you, you know, how many women are you discipling? Uh, oh, none? Okay, well, you know, you're supposed to, well, what about you? Well, no, I'm just being dignified. <laughs> I just, I'm just lighting up and hanging out at the golf course and just thinking, no, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. No, no, men are supposed to be the, becoming the men who would be qualified to be appointed as elders in the church. Now, whether a man is or not appointed, that's the Holy Spirit's job, to decide which qualified men are going to have unique roles within the leadership of the church. But all men should be, should be moving that direction. I'm discipling some, uh, some men right now. One is actually a couple of years older than me, though he's younger in the faith. One of them's younger than me and, and younger in the faith. 
So those are the two guys I'm working with right now. And I believe they both have a gift of teaching, a spiritual gift of teaching. But I'm not entirely positive. I just, I have this sense. I, I see their heart for the word of God. And I see that sound doctrine is developing in them. I see them asking a lot of excellent questions. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm trying to help them get their doctrine solid and sound. We're talking about a lot of issues. And I keep deploying them. Okay, don't, all right, now we've talked about all those things. Now go tell someone about Jesus, right? Let's not just make it head knowledge. Go, you got to be engaged in good deeds, like sharing the gospel, leading someone into the kingdom, discipling them. Anyway, I was, I was saying to the older one, uh, you know, brother, I think that you have a gift of teaching. Um, I'm not sure yet, but let's give you more opportunities to teach. So we have a Friday night home group, a Friday night fellowship. Um, and uh, when I travel, I ask my brother Chung, uh, he's a Korean believer. I said, brother, I'm gonna, I'd like you to teach. Well, he gives me, uh, he's a very sweet and godly man, and he's becoming really solid in the word. But he, early on, he was like, he would give me every excuse. I, no, I don't think, I, so listen, he said, I don't think I have the gift of teaching. I said, well, I think that you do. He said, well, I think that I don't. I said, well, I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not the Apostle Paul. I can't tell you if you do, but, but the only way we're going to find out is to see you teach. That's number one. Number two, when you look at Titus and you look at Timothy, it actually doesn't ever talk about the spiritual gifts that these men have, which is kind of interesting given the emphasis that the Apostle Paul puts on spiritual gifting in other places in the Scriptures. But what it does say, and I'll just give you an example in, um, in 1 Timothy, Timothy's all, uh, Paul is also giving a list of character qualifications of leaders. And in chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, it, talks, it says it's, an, it's a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer. I mean, in other words, Somebody wants to be a leader in the church and says, I'd like to get to that point that I'm ready for that. This is a, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, uh, and then he must be the husband of one wife, and temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and, you can read it, able to teach. I said it actually doesn't say that they have a spiritual gift of teaching. It would be good, but at the, at the minimum, they need to be able to teach. They need to have sound doctrine and be starting to think, you know what? I need to learn how to teach the Bible. I need to be able to teach young men how to study the Bible and apply it to their lives. So I said, Chung, it actually doesn't say that you need the spiritual gift because maybe the Lord isn't calling you to become a preacher, but... If the Lord is preparing you and equipping you for some oversight role in the church at some point, you need to be able to teach. And I would just encourage you, and, and, and uh, I, I don't want to use the word challenge. I won't challenge you, but I will encourage you, men. How are you doing on your study of the Word of God? Are, are you developing sound doctrine? Are you really thinking through, and with others, what is sound doctrine? What, is the, what does the Bible say about some of the controversial issues? Do I understand that? Do I understand the core issues, like the, like the gospel? Are, is there another way for Jews to come to heaven except through faith in Jesus the Messiah? No. But there's plenty of people in the Bible who said there was. Those were the Judaizers who said, yeah, it's, it's Jesus plus the law. Right? But that, that's not true biblically, and Paul explains that. So anyway, the point is, we, I want to encourage you men in your study of God's word. Are you internalizing it? Are you going deep? But are you teaching it to others? You say, I, 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 you know, I'm not a teacher. I, I, I remember my father was asked by one of the elders in this church where he was dragging my sister and me to. Uh, at one point they said, uh, Len, you're Jewish, right? He said, yeah. He said, so that means you know the Old Testament, right? And he said, why do you ask? You know, a lot of Gentiles think that Jews, we know that, the Old Testament, like just because we got up out of bed one morning and we would just know it. And, uh, you know, Jews, well, you, you gave us the Old Testament, so uh, you must know it. I wish that were true. It isn't always. Uh, but my father said, well, why do you ask? And the, and the elder said, because we have a sixth grade Sunday school class 
and we need someone to teach it. And it's basically Old Testament stories, and I just thought maybe you'd be interested in that. Now, my father is, a, is quite an introvert. I mean, a little bit too much time around the dinner table with us, he needs a little time away. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, the Lord has used him amazingly, and, and God is in just dramatic ways to teach all around the world, to teach the Bible. God gave him a gift of teaching. He just didn't know it at that stage of his life. But he thought, well, I probably know those Old Testament stories better than the sixth graders, so sure, I will do it. I mean, he prayed about it, and then he did it. And he began to discover that not only did he love the Word, but having to teach made him study more, and then trying to figure out, how do I say, how do I communicate to, what, sixth grade is like, what, 11, 12 years old? How do I communicate such amazing truth to kids? And this began the process of developing, or, or, yeah, developing the gift that he had. Here's the key. Here's the point. And, and one of the things I want to leave with you, we have the good news. And in a world, certainly in a country that has so much bad news, we need to be communicators of this good news that Jesus comes to change lives. We need to be communicators that the Holy Spirit is the one that changes our lives. You know, many uh, evangelicals are very uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. The, by, you know, Paul tells the Corinthians, a, a pretty messed up church, mind you. Listen, I know you don't get all of this, but you need to start working on a better understanding of the Holy Spirit because he's the game changer. It's the Holy Spirit in us that changes us. Now, it's true that we can use our spiritual gifts badly. We can use them in ways that make people uncomfortable. But the Holy Spirit is the one that, where we get the power to change and the power to share the gospel, right? Jesus said to someone like Peter, who was not exactly a good gospel preacher, one day, like when he denied Jesus three times, but 40 days later, he led 3,000 Jewish people to the Lord. How did that happen? Well, the Holy Spirit came upon him at Pentecost, and he received power to be Jesus' witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to change when we can't, to obey the scriptures, which are hard to do in the flesh, I would say impossible, and to share the gospel, to have the courage to tell someone who doesn't know about Jesus, about Jesus, and then to lead them into the kingdom, and then to help them to grow. This is a big part of it. Paul was investing in Titus. Yes, this letter is for all pastors and all elders. This letter is a letter uh, uh, for church uh, people in the church. But remember, Paul is writing a letter to a young man that he has trained. He's trying to help Titus become a man like Paul. Titus is not going to become Paul. He's not going to become as gifted perhaps, and as, uh, as effective maybe, but, but maybe he is. I mean, not in this particular case. We don't know that Titus went on and was more, more uh, you know, uh, fruitful than the Apostle Paul himself, but God used Titus remarkably. And my point here is, 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 is several fold. One, do you know this gospel? Are you letting it change your life? Do you know and understand sound doctrine about the Holy Spirit and you're letting him change your life. You may not understand every gift. You may not feel comfortable with how it's expressed around you. <clears throat> Paul explained that that would be the case sometimes. And, but to be patient and, and to study it yourself and to, and to say, Lord, show me how to use these spiritual gifts that you have given me. Are, and are you making disciples? Are you doing what Paul did to take, if you're a man, work with young men? You may know that Paul told uh, Titus to train the older men and train the older women, but train the older women to teach the younger women. Older men are not supposed to be teaching younger women. There's enough troubles in your life, whether you're the director of the Central Intelligence Agency or just a regular old person. You do not want to be spending extra time, undue time, with young women because that's a recipe for disaster. There's a way, biblically, this is done. And... If we stick to that, we're in better shape. If we don't, we're going to be in trouble. But if you're a man, who's your Timothy? Who's your Titus? Who's your Paul, for that matter? Every follower of Jesus Christ needs to be able to answer two simple questions. 
who is investing in me and whom am I investing in? Right? Put it another way, every follower of Jesus Christ needs to be able to have at least two relationships uh, aside from with Jesus. Do you have an apostle Paul in your life, an older, wiser man who loves the Lord and is taking you under his wing and teaching you and answering your questions and helping you become qualified in God's service? And do you have somebody younger that you are investing in intentionally, specifically spending time with that younger man? And if you're a woman, are you, do you have an older woman in your life that's investing in you, encouraging you, praying for you? And do you have a younger woman that you're investing in, training, encouraging? See, this is the work of the kingdom. We can't stop the war. We can't fix the geopolitical problems. The Bible says they're gonna, the geopolitical problems are going to get worse. Prophecy is filled with more dangers that are coming. And we spend an awful lot of time discussing, arguing, bemoaning, fretting, Worrying about things that we can't fix. Pray about them? Absolutely. But we, spent, we, we, spend an, we waste an awful lot of time on things that we cannot fix. There are things that we are uniquely called to do. Prime Minister Netanyahu is in charge of leading the war. We are not. <laughs> we can carpet what he's doing or praise him for his, what he's doing. We can pray for him. But, there's nothing, but he has a unique role that you and I do not have. But we, you and I have a role that he does not have, though I pray that he will have it one day. And that is to know the Lord and to make him known and to make disciples. Because Jesus said, "Go." I, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's in charge. He is the king of kings, you may have noted, by coming here. This is a congregation that acknowledged that he is sovereign. He is holy. He's all-powerful. He's over the prime minister. He's over the head of Hamas. He's over the president of the United States. He's over the president of Russia. He's over the UN and the EU. Jesus is in charge of everybody. Therefore, waste all your time trying to fix things you can't fix? No. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Just the Jews? No. Just the Palestinians? No. Of all nations teaching them to, or baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. My concern is that those of us who've come to faith in Jesus Christ are going to stand before heaven one day, stand before Jesus, the Messiah. And he's going to say, I'm so glad that you're in heaven now. Welcome to heaven you're going to get a tour. It's going to be exciting. We're going to show you your mansion. And, and uh, it's going to be fabulous. We, I've been preparing it for 2,000 years. You're going to be very happy with it. Amen. But I just want to take a few moments and spend some time with you. You know what I'd love to, to, to see Jesus might say? I, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here, okay? Uh, would you show me some of your disciples? I would just love to meet them. My what? <laughs> you know, your disciples. My who? What would? He said, uh, you know, do we want to stand before Jesus and have him say, show me, if you're a man, the young men that you led to the Lord. Have you led anyone to the Lord? Was that important? Was I supposed to do that? I thought that was Wayne's job. I I thought that was Billy Graham's job. You wanted me to lead people to the Lord? Oh, I, you know, I did not get that. Well, were people who knew the Lord, who knew me, did you help them to grow? Did you disciple them and invest in them, encourage them, help them to grow? (laughs) Was that an important element? Because I, uh, you know, I went to the bake sale, and, and I was there every Sunday. I was an usher. Yeah, I know, no, no, I know, but did you help anyone grow in their faith? Yeah, I, I didn't know what it meant to... What is a disciple anyway? I didn't, I didn't know what a disciple was. Did you ask anyone? Yeah, no. Uh, did you... So, uh, did, you, did you never ask how to make a disciple? What did you think about the Great Commission? Go ye therefore and make disciples. I mean, was that in Greek? Well, okay, it, actually it was, but still. <laughs> I'm concerned, in my, as I travel and, and teach around the world, uh, I teach about prophecy, but ultimately prophecy is about bad things are going to happen and then Jesus is coming. Okay? That, that's how it's, that's prophecy. 
okay? <laughs> so the question is, when you get to see Jesus, uh, what's your plan? What are you planning to say to him when he asks you, did you go and make disciples? Maybe you're making disciples and you're, you are so pro-Israel. You love Israel. You, are, you, you, know, you, 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 you dream in blue and white. You are all, you're all in. You're, you, when, if you can't sleep, you're, you're, just, you're just singing the national anthem of Israel. You're just, you, everything, you can't, you can't be here long enough. You, you can't come back fast enough. You are all Israel. And someone says, wow, that's awesome. Did you, did you have a chance to share the gospel with a Palestinian? A what? A, you know, a Palestinian, an Arab. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I'm from Texas. I say nuke them till they glow. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember? Whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Oh, do you remember when I said love your neighbor? Oh, man, well, Jesus. Well, yeah, sure, I know that. But they're not my neighbor. They're my enemy. Well, do you remember me saying, love your enemy? Oh, come on, Lord. Uh, no, I cannot love my enemy. A lot of us have that attitude or have had it. Jesus is not an either or God. There's different roles. There's different responsibilities that God has given to the nation of Israel. And there's, there's rights and there's responsibilities. But for us as followers of Christ, we are not allowed to say, well, I love Israel and I hate the Palestinians or I'm not going to listen to them, I don't care for them, I'm not even going to think about them. Jesus came to die for them. And he's coming back, and believe me, there's going to be a lot of Palestinians in heaven. Yeah. Well, have you led one to the Lord? Have you tried? I mean, I, you know, and, and vice versa. There are people on the other side who are saying, oh, I love the Palestinians. I want to do anything I can to help them know the Lord and be in heaven. The Jews, well, they're a horrible, horrible people, and they are cruel and evil. And I am not going to tell them about Jesus. I'm not going to love them. I'm not going to care for them. And Jesus said, well, don't they live right next door? Yes, they do, and that's the problem. Well, would you define that as a neighbor? Well, I don't think so. They're the enemy. Well, do you remember me saying, love your enemies? Oh, come on, Lord. That's not right. Well, th this is the attitude that many have. And sometimes we have unwittingly encouraged it by being so excited about one thing, one group of people, and never saying from the pulpit or individually or in our home groups, where, you know what, let's pray for the Palestinians who are suffering in Gaza right now. Let's pray for these people whose missiles are raining down on their heads. This is, you know, you can say, well, they are, they're Muslims. Yeah, well, you were lost too. We, you were once disobedient and, and reviling and hating people, and then Jesus showed mercy to you as he did to me, and he said, you hated me, but I loved you, and now you're in the kingdom. Well, yeah, I'm happy about that part. Well, what about for them? What about for them? This is, this is a really important part, and this is part of what we came to be part of this conference is to, you know, to encourage, just to encourage our brothers. You know, we from the outside can't, you know, we're not, Paul, we're not overseers of the churches here. We're not able to, to there's, there's a certain things we can do and there's certain things we can't do. We can love, we can pray, we can be bond servants, we can come and see, is there any way we can love and encourage Jewish and Arab believers in the land? And what about on the other side? And I'll just wrap up. Um, I've overstayed my welcome already, but I just want to say that uh, we had been really praying about whether the Arab pastors would want us to do the exact same conference on the West Bank as we were planning to do going through Titus, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, on, you know, in Netanya on the, on the Israel side. And, you know, it was, yes, conceptually they did, but you know, with Joel, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, didn't he work for Netanyahu? Yeah, yes, he did. Isn't he a Zionist? Well, yes, he is. Um, doesn't he do a lot of relief work and stuff with Israel? Yes, he does. And so that created a lot of anxieties. But I've been trying to make up for some mistakes I've made, and that is to not be proactive in building friendships with Arab pastors and, and, and believers in the West Bank. And uh, I can't really get into Gaza, especially this week, so that's, I have to meet <laughs> Gaza believers in the West Bank. But, you know, um, so I, I began over the last couple of years just to try to spend more time and just listen and let, let people 
be upset with me and, and, and walk it through and say, you know, look, there's some things are, I believe in reconciliation, but I also believe that some things are irreconcilable. And so I've said to some of my Palestinian brothers, listen, you know, let's, uh, just honestly, you and I are not going to agree on the theology of the land. Not likely. And I think we might get into a lot of strife and disputing over that. But I, I am so amazed at God and, and I'm so excited that God has drawn you into the kingdom and he's gifted you. And I, I just want to learn more about what God is doing in you because I want to help you, if you want me to, to reach all of your people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you don't want that help, that's okay. I'd still like to pray for you, I wanna, but I can't do it with unless I understand better what's happening and how to pray. And, and uh, it's been a slow process, admittedly. That's not a fast process. But I, and I had to make some apologies, you know, that I hadn't done that for a long time. And therefore, not because I had a heart of animosity, but it could have come off that way just because I hadn't been forward-leaning. Well, add all those sensitivities into... Okay, and now there are rockets raining down from the, uh, you know, on Israel, uh, on Israel, but also missiles firing at, at, at Palestinians in Gaza. You know, at, you know, yes, at military sites. But they're all next to the playgrounds and the hospitals because that's where the rockets are built into the hospitals and the gas stations. And it's all, it's all intertwined and there, are, there is collateral damage. And it's being ordered rightly from my perspective as self-defense for Israel, but by a man I used to work for. So was that really the best use of, should I really go there for the last couple of days and spend time and with all these things being sensitive anyway, did they even want me to come? And honestly, I, I was being told by some wonderful people here in the land, it's just not the right time for you to go, Joel. You know, it is, there's Hamas operatives on the West Bank. I mean, you, would, you and your team would pose quite a, Target, you know, and, and I, I, people really strongly encouraging us not to go. And we had to pray through. You know, that was not bad, wiz, bad counsel. But in the end, uh, we prayed about it, and, we, and I called the, the pastor who was the main organizer, the man of peace, who was saying, and he said, please come. We want you to come more now because it would be an act of solidarity. And, I, and we will not, we do not want to talk about political things. Some here do, but I'm not going to let them, he said. We're just going to talk about the word of God and, and, and how to encourage one another to reach the world for Jesus, our world. And that's about as close to a, to a Macedonian call as I had ever had. Literally a call. I mean, I mean, talking, you know, that was a vision that Paul had. I, I was like on a phone of a man saying, please come, especially now. And we prayed about it and... We did it, and I have to say, it was one of the most special times, just two and a half days, with these brothers. I got to know men I did not know. They were a little cool at first, but, you know, they have a hard life, and I don't understand it. I've never lived a life like theirs, and I have, an, I have a ticket home. I can leave. I needed to go in and humble myself before those men and just, you know, yes, teach, but listen. Well, this has gone on longer than I, I meant, and I, I, I want to encourage you, though. One, to love and pray for people on both sides. To share the gospel while you're here with everyone that you possibly can. Lest the rapture happen tonight or tomorrow and you say, yeah, I didn't really do that. And are you making disciples? Are you taking younger believers under your wing and investing in them? I hope that you are. Let's close in prayer. <coughs> Father in heaven, we love you very much. And we thank you very much for what you're doing. I thank you for what you did in Paul's life and what you used Paul to do in the life of Titus and what you told Titus to do in the lives of the believers in Crete. Lord, I thank you for that transmission of faith from generation to generation. And I pray that you do that in all of us. And Lord, we do pray for our Palestinian brothers and sisters as well as those who don't know you and even who hate you. Um, we also pray for Israelis who love you who love you so dearly, and those who don't know you, and those who hate you. We pray that you would be gracious and bring peace and security and calm to both sides. And we pray you do a great transforming work of the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit on both sides, that we would someday worship side by side together at your feet in this city, not ashamed that we did nothing, but having been faithful with the few things that you told us to do. 
We pray these things in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ.